Staying Ergo Healthy, Office Ergonomics 101, presented by Heffernan Consulting. We're so happy you could join us today. I'm Diane Probert, and I'll be moderating the session today. And we'll be monitoring any questions that you may have during the session. Before we open up the session, let's just review a few key items. If you have trouble with your internet connection during the webinar, we recommend leaving the presentation and logging back in. If you have audio difficulties or a telephone line goes dead during the call, hang up and call back again to the same number. If all the lines go dead, watch the on-screen chat box for an alternative call-in number. Feel free to ask questions or provide feedback via the chat box during the webinar. If you're using a tablet, you may need to tap on the screen for the options bar to appear. Then you can select the appropriate option. We may not respond immediately, but we'll work your questions or feedback into the presentation. If we can't get to your comment or questions during the session, we will be online afterwards to respond. You may also email us at moderator at aspenrmg.com for up to 24 hours after the webinar. And lastly, we have a number of webinars upcoming. If you just go to this website shown on your screen here, aspenrmg.com slash webinars, you will see a list of all of the webinars, and these are the past webinars, and then going all the way down to the bottom of the page, you'll be able to see all of the ones that are coming up for the rest of the year. And then if you scroll all the way down to the bottom of the page, you'll be able to see all of the resource materials for the past webinars and for today's webinar. If you just click on this link, you'll be able to get a PDF copy of today's presentation. This will be a one-hour presentation. Questions and comments are very much encouraged throughout. And today's interactive session will be facilitated by Steve Thompson, arm and cost of Aspen Risk Management Group and Ergo Healthy. Steve has had many years of successful ergonomic support, writing, and training. And Steve looks forward to bringing this educational session to you. I'm going to go ahead and turn the screen over to Steve. Thank you so much for being with us today, Steve, and welcome. Thank you very much, Diane. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to be with everyone on the call. And uh, what an exciting day f for me, and that is to talk about a subject that both enhances uh, one's physical and mental well-being. And Diane, I have clicked on the button to show my screen, and just to confirm technology, are we on? Yes. Great. Well, I also want to thank Heffernan uh, Insurance uh, Group and all of the folks there for inviting us to participate in this today. And um, okay, so we've learned a lot over the past couple of years of integrating uh, some good ergonomic principles and movement, uh, and that movement can positively impact those that have a sedentary lifestyle. So part of today's presentation will review some of the, the more recent research, and then we'll also uh, talk about some of the things that can be done to offset some of the problems associated with uh, sedentary life. And of course, we'll discuss all of the, the newest and the most appropriate um, ergonomics and safe behaviors uh, you know, within the office ergonomic environment. But more than anything, I would say that we welcome your participation today and your energy as we explore some core ergonomic principles and some real world practices. Secondly, there will be a number of polling questions, and Diane will explain those in a moment, but we do have a first one that we want to ask you as we start. So would you mind, um, Diane, launching our first polling question? Of course. So the question is, how would you gauge your ergonomic knowledge? And then there's selections. Just go ahead on your screen and pick the option that best describes your knowledge. Are you above average, average? could use some improvement, no knowledge, this is my first time learning about it, or other. So if you just go ahead and click on A, B, C, D, or E, we do appreciate your participation in the polling questions. It gives us a good feeling of who's out there. Thank you so much. All right, so I'm going to give everyone a couple more seconds to get your answers in. And I'm going to go ahead and close out that poll. And Steve, it looks like 41% of our audience could use some improvement, 33% have average experience, 14% have above average experience, and 12% have no knowledge. This is their first time learning about it. 
Okay, well thank you very much everyone and thank you Diane and for our 14 percenters out there with the uh, above average experience we we look forward to your feedback and comments uh, in supporting uh, ideas thoughts you may have based on your experience so please feel free to uh, input in your chat or your question box and for those of you that uh, could use a little bit more information well great you're here and then you're you're in the right place this will be a mix of both advanced information and also foundational so it should be a good fit for everyone okay great all right so there have been some very interesting findings coming out in the past two years about sedentary lifestyles and let's face it if if you have people and they're sitting at their desk and they sit there for four six eight hours a day uh, there are a couple of things that can be done to help improve their life we have a number of studies that have come out that indicate that prolonged sedentary lifestyles causes some problems now I've identified a few of them in the uh, in the sedentary uh, life bullet items there about DNA repair mechanisms etc but one of the studies in particular studied 70 744 men between the ages of 20 and 89 now this study is published in the uh, National Institutes of Health and there are a lot of studies that have been done in the last couple of years on this subject now this this will be hard to to hear these numbers but for those that were in this study there was an 82 and 64 percent increased risk of dying of cardiovascular disease mortality for those that had increased levels of sedentary behavior and the only sedentary lifestyles that they were looking at was hours of television and the hours spent in a car now the study did not involve the work environment but I think we can extrapolate information from that but they looked at the hours riding in a car and the hours watching television as it relates to that and the interesting part was this was in the range of 20 hours per week brought these kinds of increases in mortality rates that's a pretty steep increase 82 and 64 percent respectively and they had some breakouts of that but I think that it tells us that we should be looking at ways to move more frequently get up etc the other study that came out last year from Australia indicates that by getting up frequently at least every hour um, help stabilize blood sugar levels and obviously as blood sugar levels increase it increases the the um, chance of diabetes and that study in Australia was done on women I've got to believe that the study is uh, would would indicate similar findings for men but in that case uh, increased diabetes risk by long terms of sitting and the sitting was again spent not in the workplace but outside of work so if you combine a, a job that sits most of the time and then other activities that are sitting uh, increases in uh, instability of blood sugar and increased health risks associated with cardiovascular disease are all part of it so the reason that we have the Bee Gees there is as we're talking about staying ergo healthy uh, I think it's important to remember about just by practicing some simple behaviors it will help you and help those and those in your organizations actually stay alive reducing the health risks associated with sedentary life sedentary work and the combination of those two all right and by the way if you you've probably heard the new CPR uh, guidelines which is the compressions only and that if you are able to hum the tune staying alive in your head and that's the um, number of compressions that you use then that's the n pro proper number of compressions to use when you're doing uh, the new uh, um, CPR okay there's the association there are a couple of other things that come from uh, sedentary uh, lives and sedentary jobs and we, we know that 40% of work comp costs are musculoskeletal disorders and you know that could be strains, sprains, cumulative trauma, other types of disorders. 
there was a pilot study done a few years ago by Cisco and Accenture, uh, about 10,000 employees total, where they wanted to identify if employee was having some sort of discomfort from either sitting, uh, maybe it was a, a wrist, a shoulder, whatever, from doing um, you know, repetitive type work in a work environment. They wanted to test to see how often does a person pull off task to rub their elbow or do whatever. And the studies were done less about the issue of pain and more about the issues of lost productivity. And once some simple interventions were made uh, at, at both organizations, they had a 62% decrease in reported discomfort, 39% decrease in claims for ergonomic injuries. So there are times uh, that pain or problems with an ergonomic injury or even before a claim is filed, it could be years that a person is having minor challenges with doing a particular type of work. For instance, if a person is using their right mouse, they're using a mouse and they use it on the right hand for 20 years, they're probably going to develop something in their, in their shoulder or their back at some point in time. I'm not saying that they will, but there's a higher chance. But if they were to rotate between the right and the left hand every 30 days, the chances of a problem developing are um, reduced by a dramatic amount. So just some interesting stats as it relates to the time that could be lost and productivity out of the study that was done. And this is based on what a person may get paid per hour. And in the, uh, in the Cisco Accenture study, it was really about, again, they were looking at it as productivity, billable hours. What were they losing by people having um, pain or discomfort relating to an ergonomic problem? All right, why do we focus on office ergonomics and why is it important today to think about this? Well, it doesn't take any time at all for us to recognize that there has been a proliferation of sedentary activities aside from work. And just take a look at the big ones, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram. Look at the number of users, active users, that are involved in these particular activities. And it's really quite overwhelming. When somebody in the past might be going out for a walk on the street or walk across, you know, into the local park, now we're spending time on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or other places. So there's been a real, and that's not even counting gaming and other activities. And for those of you that have young people uh, in your life or kids or otherwise, you know that this has just taken off dramatically. And it's just not that. It's the advent of the, of the actual electronic devices. Uh, if you've ever been on a train, a bus, a plane, whatever, all you have to do is look around anywhere around you at any given time, restaurant, whatever, people, for the most part, have something in their hand with their necks bent down looking at it. The very, very interesting changes that are happening in our world. So a couple of other things we've learned over the last five years uh, as it relates to ergonomics, especially ergonomics in the office, is the importance of of getting knowledge. In the past, we would come into a work environment like an ergonom ergonomics person and let me fix that for you and make the adjustments. And then, of course, what happens? The person doesn't really adjust to that environment. Let's say, for instance, they make an adjustment of their, their keyboard or their monitor or whatever. And many times, those things will go back to being the way that they were before. And that's not any, um, that's generally a lack of knowledge or a place of comfort. When you make ergonomic changes, they might be difficult in the beginning. That's because you've been doing something a certain way. When you change from the right hand to the mouse, it's going to take 48 to 72 hours for your brain to adapt to using the mouse on the opposite hand. Now, if you're a graphic artist and you make your living by doing artwork or something like that, I think it would be difficult to move between the right and the left hand and to do that every 30 days. The other things we've learned is that a lot of a, a lot of the changes made today are self-directed. We've had the advent of smartphones, and I don't even need to go on about sedentary life. Now, ergonomics goes back a long ways. Uh, we know that the earliest stages were the the building of the pyramids. We we would agree that there were ergonomics used in the process of that. It's also the first time that we we uh, we had the first back injury reported. 
And for those of you that uh, have either spent time with, um, uh, with any of the recent television shows indicating that perhaps uh, aliens participated in the building of the pyramids, uh, I wanted to make sure that I covered that with the group on the call today. I, I never know who we'll have on the call, and I want to make sure that I, I cover that clearly. So modern ergonomics started mostly in the uh, military, and it had to do with uh, ejection seats. Uh, when the earliest planes came out, uh, the guy would carry a parachute with him, he'd jump out, open the canopy, and jump out. Of course, things bad things could happen from that because the plane just might not be flying along at a level ground. It could be going forward, up, down. Plane could be falling apart. Whatever, be difficult to climb out. Once ejection seats were designed, they uh, decided in in the first planes to put them far away from the pilot so they couldn't reach it. So they have to bend down and reach it. Of course, when the G forces were holding the pilot back as the plane was crashing, couldn't reach the uh, ejector. Uh, button. So we've learned a lot about the integration of doing things from an ergonomic perspective. And you see it in the design of cars, in the design of equipment, even when it comes down to the design of, yes, working in your garden. For those of you that might have one, there are ergonomic tools that are designed. If any of you, when you were younger, read The Jungle by Upton Sinclair, you know that, that the book uh, really talks about the portrayal of immigrants in the U.S., particularly Chicago in the industrial, during the Industrial Revolution. And things like that Styrex ergonomic knife were developed so that instead of holding a knife in the normal position, which can cause awkward positions in the shoulder and the back, you get a more comfortable position. And the office environment has changed pretty dramatically. I always liked that pink typewriter up there. But in essence, we had the manual typewriters of the 1950s. We went to the office typewriter in the 1970s. And of course, today we use modern computers and keyboards and mouse and even touch screens today and other devices. Uh, where does it go next? It probably will involve more sedentary lifestyles. But think about it a moment. We had very few repetitive motion injuries and cumulative trauma in the 50s through the 70s and into the 80s. This was before computers. And when you used the type of devices that were designed in the past, like the manual typewriter, uh, the positioning of your wrists, the uh, need to use that little, uh, for those of you that are not familiar, that little metal rod that's coming out of the left-hand side of this, of this item here, that's where you would, re that's the return key. That is actually the return handle. You would actually physically move the whole device back uh, to start at the beginning of a sentence. So there was a lot more movement, and it was very varied. Today, when you're working on a computer, you're not doing any of these other activities. You're not using muscles to press the keys. You're really, hands are just staying in one position, and you're using a backspace or a delete key or whatever. Versus in the past, you had to go through a pretty uh, interesting rigmarole to, uh, to actually correct an error. Now. I missed that question. So, Diane, we have a second question for our audience. Can we ask that, please? Certainly. So, beyond work, how many hours per day are you sedentary? In the car, bus, home, TV, dining, entertainment, computer, tablet, phone, etc. So, how many hours? Two to four hours? Five to six hours? Seven to eight hours? Eight hours or more? Or other? Go ahead and please pick the best choice for you. And nobody's watching, folks. Uh, this is uh, nobody knows that it's you who's answering these questions. Uh, we're using it just so that we can post it on the screen. We don't know who you are that's answering which question. We're not going to report back to your significant other. Hey, uh, you answered that you're working out five, you know, five hours a week. Uh, there's no reporting going on here, folks. Okay, and we're just going to give everyone a couple more seconds to get your votes in. And we're going to go ahead and close out this polling question. And it looks like 44% 2 to 4 hours, 30% 5 to 6 hours, 21% 8 hours or more, and 5% sedentary 7 to 8 hours. 
Well, that's great. We've got people working out on the call today. I love to hear that. That's great. Now, the reason that we start to probe to this question is that when we, probably up till about, well, let's say, 10 years ago, most people in ergonomics would only focus on the work environment. As a matter of fact, they'd go in, look at the workstation, and say, yeah, you make these adjustments, you'll be good to go. And you know what? That is completely the wrong approach. Yes, the work environment's important. Yes, how a computer is set up. Yes, how you use your smartphone and your tablet and your keyboard and how you're sitting. All very important. But you know what we missed? We missed the rest of the person's life. So, for instance, let's take a quick look at this. There are 168 total hours in a week. I know some of that is sleeping, but most people work on average 40 to 45 hours a week. That's average. We know some people work more, some people work less, but it is what it is. 77% of that time during the course of the week is away from your workplace. 23% of that time is spent at work. When you take away sleep, you're looking at about 35% of your time at work and the remaining time away. Now, if you compile this over a lifetime, and let's say the average person today retires around 70-ish, maybe a little bit older, and then you've got another 10 or 15 years to live after that, you're really looking at occupational work being over a lifetime, maybe 20% of your time. I know it seems like a lot more than that, but it's not. So we have to be cognizant of the things that happen outside of work. And as we just talked about in the earlier slides about the lifestyle and the things that can cause problems, i.e. a sedentary lifestyle, we need to be cognizant of that. We have another polling question, Diane. Okay. On average, how many hours per week do you exercise? Please select one. A, zero to one hour. B, two to three hours. C, four to five hours. D, six hours or more. Or E, other. I must have missed. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, Diane. I was thinking about the previous question, but um, I got my own wires crossed here. Okay, I'm going to give everyone just a couple more seconds to get their answers in. Go ahead and choose the one that best describes how many hours you work, uh, exercise. Excuse me, and I'm going to go ahead and close out that poll, Steve. And it looks like 29% of our listeners do four to five hours, and 29% do two to three hours, followed by zero to one hour at 26%, and 17% of our audience are doing six hours or more. Wow, that's amazing. Okay, I, I love hearing that. That's, a great, that's, a great, that's great to hear. Uh, and, and that directly relates to today's view on ergonomics in the office environment, and that is we want to get the big picture. So when you're sitting in, when a person's sitting in their car, they want to make sure that they adjust the mirror at the beginning of the day or beginning of when they get in the car uh, so that you know, they're sitting upright with good posture. They want to make sure that they're sitting with their head in the center of the headrest so that they're not, uh, you know, leaning to one side and have good posture even while you're driving. So the next time you get in your car, double check to make sure that your posture is good. You're sitting upright, shoulders back. Now, one of the challenges today is that cars, uh, unfortunately, are not very ergonomic in their seats. Unfortunately, with the advent of the bucket seat in the 1960s, creates a lot of forward-leaning shoulders. For those of you just sitting in your chairs right now, you look down at your shoulders. Are they leaning forward? Are they back in good posture? And unfortunately, sitting in a car seat pushes those shoulders forward, which reduces dramatically your hand strength. So if you were to do a, if you were to do a gripper and uh, you know, check the grip strength of your hands and put your hands in a, in a in you know, a good upright posture position with your shoulders back, you'd see that your grip strength is, is many times stronger than if you bring your shoulders forward. So unfortunately, some of the thing, the modern conveniences have unfortunately, you know, starting to, to affect us. And things like bucket seats and couches and things like that push our shoulders forward. So something to think about outside of work, but critical to our health. We have another polling question for our audience. 
Okay, which electronic devices do you use? Please select all that apply. So for this one, you can cl click A, B, C, D, E, or all of them at the same time, or one or two. So just go ahead and click on all of the electronic devices that you currently use. I always like the results of this this question because I sometimes, Diane, we've actually learned when people have typed in other electronic devices that we've never heard of. It's Correct. Been great. Yeah. All right. Can I give everyone just a couple more seconds? And then I'm going to go ahead and close out this poll. Thank you so much for participating. We do appreciate it. And it looks like 94% are using smartphones. 85% laptops, 63% tablets, 8% gaming consoles, and we have 18% other electronic devices. Other, other, other electronic okay. devices. Maybe some of those folks can uh, send in in their chat box what those might be. That would be great. Thank you, Diane, for that question. And that's remarkable when we think about it. Do you know that um, right now in the U.S., less than 10% of, of Americans have a landline only in their home? Less than 10% of Americans have a landline only in their home. Isn't that just a remarkable change in the last 20 years? What an incredible difference of what we're facing as it relates to communication today. And uh, laptops and tablets. Uh, we don't have too many gamers on our call. But that's okay. We're with you, gamers. Party on. As I mentioned earlier, there is a huge uh, increase in the amount of uh, social media environment. And again, we have a polling question for you. Diane, can we ask question five? Absolutely. Just give me one second to pull that up. Thank you so much. And if you use social media, which ones do you use? Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, or other. Again, you can select all that apply. And just to let you know, Steve, while everyone's choosing these, the comments that we got um, as others were desktop and tower computers. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, I would agree. Uh, we're almost forgetting to put those anymore because laptops and other devices have taken them over. Great mm -hmm. point. Thank you. Okay. All right. Going to go ahead and close out this poll. And it looks like 75% of our audience are Facebookers, 16, 60% excuse me, are LinkedIn, 50% go to YouTube for videos, and 18% are tweeting on Twitter, and 22% are using other social media outlets. Other social media. And again, folks, if you wouldn't mind sharing with us, we can add that to our future polls. I'm going to bet there is some either Pinterest or some Instagram users out there based on what I heard before. But we'd love to hear any others that you use, and we can add those into our database. Thank you, Diane. Mm -hmm. Well, let's start off with some basics of, of office ergonomics, if we can. And of course, it starts with the chair. It starts with how a person sits. And the very basic way of, of an average size person, of course, if you're shorter, you probably use some, you'll need some sort of uh, footrest. If you're taller, you might have to make some adjustments uh, to your chair that are, that are different than what's in the photo on the right. But certainly, you want to make sure there's some sort of knee support. Uh, the lumbar support should be available to you should you decide to use it. And the depth of the seat should be pretty much so that it ends up supporting your entire uh, lower parts of your thighs uh, so that you know there aren't 10 inches of your thighs hanging over the chair or that the chair is so big you're, you're, um, you know, you're an Edith Ann and you're sitting in a, you feel like you're sitting in a giant chair and you can barely get your legs over the end. So here's a very simple methodology to, to, to adjust your seat if your workstation and everything else is you know, comparable. Notice that the armrests have been removed on this chair. And we'll talk about that in a little bit and the importance of doing that in most cases. Uh, it allows for much better shoulder and posture and um, a core uh, muscular um, strengthening. But we'll get to that in a little bit. 
Well, let's go through five simple steps that people use to set up their workstation, how we recommend it. And we'll go through each of those. But this is a very basic workstation. There's nothing complex to review here. This person's a little bit shorter than the average, so we wanted to add in a couple of things that, uh, that make it uh, knowledgeable, uh, make it, uh, you know, um, uh, I say relatable to those that would have a workstation like this. And we'll talk about some of the things that could be a challenge in this workstation, and we'll also talk about some things that we see out there, and we'll ask you to help us identify them. But this is a basic, fundamental workstation setup. Notice there are no under-the-table keyboard trays. There are no elaborate uh, monitor stand, stands or anything like that. This is a very basic keyboard setup. It's very safe. It's uh, ergonomically correct. And this person can work for hours and hours and hours uh, at a very comfortable level. A couple of key points in the picture, as you can well see, excuse me, as you can well see in this picture, we have her uh, elbows are about 90 degrees, uh, posture is good, shoulders are back, uh, chin is tucked back slightly, a couple of things, forearms are uh, pretty much on a horizontal plane, and the wrists are in a straight uh, position. This is generally the most comfortable position for people. And we're not expecting a person to stay in this position for eight hours a day. The old OSHA, NIOSH safety approach was get you in the right position and then let's freeze you there the whole day. You've seen all the pictures. Today we believe it's okay to fidget. It's okay to move around. It's okay to use the backrest then not use the backrest. It's okay to stretch out a little bit while you're sitting. It's okay to make adjustments during the day. What you want to strive for, though, is to have a more frequent position of this. This is the more appropriate position. But if you're going to take a few minutes and lean forward, lean back, that's OK. But if you're going to stay in those awkward positions you know, for longer periods of time, they can cause some problems. The knees, as we, fo uh, as we photographed in this shot, you can see that they're relatively horizontal. This person has a about a 90 degrees, that can be anywhere from 90 to 110 degrees. But what we're looking for is that the thighs are, are somewhat parallel to the floor and that the feet are supported. In this case, we can see the armrests have been removed. The uh, chair is a five-prong chair, which is generally the most, you know, the safer of the chairs. They used to make a four-pronger uh, chair, but five is generally what you're looking for. And as we suggested before, some people like to sit back and use the contour of the support. Others will never sit back. They'll sit forward on the chair and they'll have good posture by sitting upright. And that's okay too. Uh, we don't want to constantly push people into a position that doesn't work for them. And it's okay to alternate. It's really okay. Uh, in this particular case, this chair back goes up and down, so it can be adjusted so that the curve goes right into the lower part of the back, which is, which is the natural curvature of the spine. Now, this, is, this can be very subjective and, uh, as it relates to the monitor position. And let's, let's talk logically why that is today. When all these original rules were made up for computer workstations and the distance and the height, it was all made with 13 and 14-inch and monitors. Oh, it should be arm's length away, and you know, it should be your eye should be in line with the top of the monitor. Well, we agree that when this smaller monitor is being used, but what if a person is using a 19-inch monitor, or a 20-inch, or a 22-inch, or a 23-inch, or whatever inch monitor that's being used? Well, what you're really looking at is where is the work being done on the screen? Not that the fact that the monitor is at the top of the screen. We don't know how many tabs or advertising or windows or tabs or whatever up here, or ribbons or whatever. Now, granted, you're going to be looking at the ribbons on if you're using Microsoft, but where is the bulk of the work being done? That's the area that you need to think about adjusting for the eyes. So wherever the top of the work is, that's about where you want the eyes um, to be placed. So a monitor might be higher. But the work is being done in this section of the monitor. And of course, where the work is being done can be adjusted based on uh, the, the, the window design and, and the software design, et cetera. So be cognizant of it. 
does, it's not a hard and fast rule that you'd stretch your arm out. It should be the distance, um, you know, between uh, the, you know, between the monitor. Today, depending on, uh, there's multifocal lenses that are used, uh, has to make adjustments for that. So just keep in mind that these are general adjustments, but things have changed and things continue to change based on the, the products. I have I've read reports um, uh, from 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 those in in uh, in researching that our visual acuity has changed over the last hundred years and more so even even over the last four to five hundred years because we because of reading uh, prior to reading we had excellent vision uh, and our vision was typically 2015 uh, everyone and some even better than that. Uh, because our visual acuity changed when we started to read, and our visual acuity has changed since we started to use computers. Now it'll probably take another hundred years or so for you know those physical changes to be embedded to our offspring, but nevertheless we're changing. And although we're adjusting for these these types of um, you know distances today, it might not be the same in the future. Uh, some people at work. Uh, with other work might use a document holder that might be on the side of the monitor it might be in front of the person depending on what they do and of course never use a phone and cradle it on the side of your neck there are some very for those of you that answered that question about smartphones obviously we have 94 percent of you using a smartphone and if you're using a smartphone or a tablet do your very best to try and use good posture when you're texting or you're or you're looking at something online I know that it's difficult to do, and I know that it's easy to get in a crunched position, but try to be very conscious of it and help your people, help your kids, help your family members, help your friends, help your coworkers. Get into good positions so that, that the neck is tucked, chin is tucked back in. Uh, you're attempting to find a, a positive position that you're not all slunched o shrunched over like this. This is not doing any kind of uh, goodwill for you. They talk about the hundred that, that the neck being uh, bent over like this is well over a hundred pounds of pressure in the spine and the upper back, and there have been a couple of studies done on this. What's happening to people? I'll be writing about it in a blog that comes out next month about the physical changes that are happening to people because of this posture. So find a comfortable place, but use good posture. Of course, uh, you don't want to text while driving, and if you're using voice-to-texting features, that can be helpful so that you're texting less and might not be in a position you can actually hold it near your mouth. Things about working with your tablet, let's face it, tablets are extremely difficult to work with in an ergonomic way. They just are, unless you're using a keyboard and a mouse and you can prop it up. But using it for general fun, watching a movie, um, you know, surfing the internet, checking email, whatever you're going to do, I mean, it's difficult to use them because they're not designed to be used in an ergonomic way. There are devices you can buy that you can prop up in front of you and use them, but they're very difficult to use, so you have to think about the, the ways to protect yourself is with posture. So the location of the tablet, we have some graphical vi visuals here. I don't need to go through them. Again, it all revolves around how, what's the position of your neck, what's the position of your arms, your shoulders, etc. Some people love to tap a, tap a uh, tablet or a smartphone hard, and they're adjustable. So what you want to remember is just use the minimal amount that's necessary, and you know, you know, obviously take breaks like you would with any other activity. Now here are some things we see when we go out there and we have a few photos and we're going to ask you in a couple moments of some of the things that you would see. Now in this picture on the left here, uh, I'd like you to just take a moment to type in on your chat box or your question box, depending on what you have, some of your thoughts in this picture on the upper left hand side. What are some things that you see that could be improved in this photo? This person happens to be working at a sit stand workstation, uh, which can be used in some instances, but I'd like you to type in just a few things that you see that you might improve, and especially for that 14% of the audience that has a lot of experience. We want to hear from you. 
So Diane, I'll just give everybody a second to give us some feedback of some of the things that people see in this photo which could be improved. Okay, well so far we have quite a few comments including arms are not at 90 degrees. Yay, that's a great one, absolutely. So this person must be pretty tall and their table is not up high enough. Excellent. And we have elbows at incorrect angle. Yes. No, floor, no floor mat. Great point. You'd probably want to use some sort of light anti-fatigue mat, right? Okay, good. Saying that uh, they should have a higher monitor. Exactly. You can see, we can't see his head, but it's probably, what, a good foot above that? And look at the monitor. It would be easily way too low. Yeah, we have a lot of people saying to raise the monitor, for sure. Oh, great. Okay. And, Anything else? Um, well, someone else noticed that the, the uh, taller chair would be needed if he did want to sit down. Yes, exactly. Uh, well, the desk would come down and it would be uh, lowered, but we just have no idea of that, but that's a great point. And then here's an interesting one. Provide a footrest so that one leg can be bent. While oh, can. somebody, okay, that person, if we had a, a gift to give you right now, just know that we're putting a big star up on the screen for that. Now, that person must have had experience by going to a bar at one point in time. For anybody on the call that's ever been to a bar, there's something when you, when you, when you walk up to the bar, there's something down by your feet. So somebody in the audience guessed that. Now there's a reason that that's there. The reason that that is there in most bars, or many bars, is that you will stay longer. You will stay longer at the bar when you can elevate one foot and alternate them. It reduces dramatically the pressure in the lower back. And so therefore, we absolutely would want to use a small foot rest, maybe six inches tall, for this person so that they could rest one foot. Now, they don't always have to have one foot up, but they want to be able to alternate. Put the right foot up 20 minutes, put the left foot up 20 minutes, sit down for 20 minutes, get up, put the left foot up, left. Exactly. Great point. Thank you, audience, for all your great feedback. All right, as we move across, we can see some of the photos here in these pictures. Definitely bent over, uh, hunched back. This guy's using his, these guys are using their phones in the wrong position, easily done. This woman, unfortunately, is finding a way to work in her work environment, and she's been doing this for years, and this is very comfortable for her. And as you can see, she has her leg uh, uh, bent on, on her knee so she can support her work. She's uh, outstretching her arms dramatically. And by the way, she was having some shoulder and elbow pains. Can you wonder why? So obviously, lots of adjustments to be made for this particular person. Here's a guy that was very, uh, very upright in his work, and he felt that he, you know, did a great job. And but he's too straight. Now what he's done is he's exchanged his chair, and of course he's working from work down here, so he's he's bent over. But he's using this fitness ball as his chair in this picture. Now there aren't any studies that have been done. Uh, there have been studies that have been done that show that fitness balls are not good to be used as full-time office chairs at all. And there are a lot of reasons why. Uh, partially, it doesn't help support the lower back. There are micro adjustments that people have to make most of the day, and that causes fatigue in the lower back. So. I would not recommend using fitness balls. The, er, the ergonomic industrial hygiene community has not found them yet through studies that they are effective. And in this particular case, he's really working too hard to stay up. That is not the natural curvature of the spine. Here's a simple one. Anytime you're working on a computer, this guy is obviously uh, putting some pressure on his wrists. And there is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a sensitive area. Uh, let's face it, there are tendons, ligaments, even arteries that flow very close here uh, to the body, uh, to the top of the body. And if you do this continuously, you probably have a little pressure in there. Is there anything else in this photo that you see that you might make an adjustment to or might change? And you can type in on your chat or your question box. Anything else in this photo that you might change?
Any feedback at all, Diane, or should we give him the answer? It looks like we have um, several people that say she changed the keyboard. Um, possibly, yes. Need a wrist, wrist rest. Probably for this person, probably, yes. Um, there's curved fingers. And here is the winner. The watch is too big. Yay! <laughs> That person should also receive a star. We have to figure this out, Diane, on these webinars. That's right. And we've had quite a few people coming to us with the new Apple Watch or the other smart watches, and people are loving them, and they're wearing them. But not while you're keying, folks. You have to take them off unless you to keep total elevation of your wrists and you don't rest the, any part of that on the body, on the, on the, uh, either on the wrist rest or otherwise. That's right. Big jewelry, wrist jewelry, watches, smart watches, whatever, take them off when you're working on your computer keyboard. They give you they give they only will cause problems in the future. You know what? Guys in construction, uh, guys that work in warehouses, they have to remove things like their rings when they're working. They can't get it caught in equipment. They can't get things caught. So, you know what? If 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 you have people working on their keyboards, et cetera, and those wrists are resting on something, then you've got to remove that. You're causing a problem. So double star for the person who caught that one. This is a simple fix. Obviously, this person has been working this way for many years and started to develop some elbow, shoulder, and wrist problems. Well, I think it's pretty obvious what's going on here. Uh, they're using a keyboard tray, which is useless because there's no room for the mouse. And they're attempting to use a mouse on a table, which is about a mile away. This is all very ineffective and doesn't work. Simple fix, what do you do? You know what we do with this particular picture is you'd simply take the person, get rid of the keyboard tray, put the keyboard on top of the desk, move them about six inches closer or so to the desk, raise their chair up, and they would be as good as gold. Probably have to raise their monitor up a little bit too. And that's what we did. You fix something like that and they're ready to go. Here's a person that does work from home also and this was their work environment and this is the way they worked. They happened to work from big binders translating French to English and that was their job. And here's their workstation. Hunched over very unhappy. This person was actually wearing some wrist rests. Best way out of it? They're working in a nice upright position, had to get a different chair. This chair was about 60 years old. They got a different chair. Whoops, sorry about that. Let me go back. Got a new chair, got better posture. They love wearing their watch. That's okay. They weren't resting it or putting pressure on anything. Just a lot better for that person. Much happier. No problems. Now, unfortunately, there are things that we can't do anything about when it comes to office, sedentary work. We, we just can't do certain things. And there are some factors that we can do something about, but I do want to talk about some things that might be difficult to deal with. So first off, there are individual injury factors that can lead to musculoskeletal injuries. Now, gender through many studies has shown that women tend to have a higher prevalence of some musculoskeletal injuries. And uh, Diane knows that I was speaking, I've mentioned before that I was speaking to a group of 600 women one time, and a woman in the back of the room raised her hand and said, well, I know why women have a higher prevalence of musculoskeletal disorders, and that's because they work harder than men. I did not question that fact at the meeting, and I left that there on the table. But it is what it is. We don't know why, although I'll discuss in a moment possibly why. We know that cigarette smoking can, uh, some people can have an increase of pain in their extremities, including the neck and back, and it's believed that the nicotine is what causes a, um, a problem. It, it's a vasoconstrictor. And so if a person has a predisposition to a back injury or uh, they're at a certain age or they've had an old injury, that smoking as a vasoconstrictor brings less oxygen to the area and therefore has potential for a higher incidence of musculoskeletal um, disorder. The government 
uh, did tests many years ago to determine uh, that the average man, they just took the average man, 35-year-old man, he could lift 70 pounds over his head, the average woman could lift 35 pounds over her, their, her head. And for those women that were weaker, they tended to have people, uh, people who were, quote, weaker, they couldn't do those numbers, had a higher incidence of musculoskeletal injuries. Height, weight, body mass index, and obesity have also been identified as indicators for certain types of musculoskeletal disorders. It's still a little bit unknown because there are a lot of other factors that uh, exist within um, body mass index and height and weight. And then the lack of physical activity may increase the susceptibility to injury. Now on the right side here, we have a woman's arm and we have a man's arm. Most women, now if you're a woman and you're on the call and you put your arm in front of you or lay it down at your side and you put the palm up, put it in this position, most women's arms will bend out slightly away from the body, as you can see in this picture, most. If you're a woman and your arm doesn't do that, don't worry about it. Most men's arms just go straight down. We don't know why this is. We have no idea. We, we, a scientist could try to point this out. We just don't know. So there are going to be individual injury factors that we can't understand or do anything about. Okay, let's talk about taking care of your back, and I want to make sure that we talk about this because in the work environment, uh, you may have a sedentary job, but then you've got to go lift something up, a ream of paper, this or that. Well, the important thing to remember for each of you on the call is if you can remember when you were a baby, which is tough to do, but I'll remind you here in a moment. If you have a niece or nephew or you have a friend that has a toddler, I want you to think about how they lift. Now. Here are some really good photos of little babies. I call them babies. I'll call them toddlers. Now this guy here on the right, look at the posture this little guy is using to lift up something off the ground. Look at that. Knees bent, uh, just hips right in alignment. Just awesome, awesome, awesome posture. This little girl here, just again, awesome posture and lifting. Just perfect, perfect posture. Uh, this little kid here, uh, yes, perfect posture. No, they're not sitting on anything and they're not doing anything else. That's not an image of that. But this is a direct indication that we actually knew how to lift correctly at one time. And this is what we want to think about when we're going to lift things. We want to use good posture when we're lifting. And there are all sorts of classes, you know, hold the load close, no twisting, no bending, etc. you know, when you're lifting. But we used to know how to lift just right. But what happens is as we age, we start to take shortcuts. We do things that are that are, you know, are faster. We bend over at the waist. We want to carry more things in than we can. We only want to make one load, uh, one trip from the car to the house with those groceries. And therefore we end up hurting ourselves. So we have to think about what it was like as a baby. And if we just think about lifting like a baby, we will do much better in preventing back injuries. As we close out, I have a couple of points that I'd like to make. First, uh, some basic ideas are to routinely alternate hands for physical tasks. So for instance, you're in the shower. You're about ready for the next 30 days. You, let's say you always pick up the shampoo in the right hand and you squirt it out into the left. Well, I'd like you for the next 30 days to pick it up with the left hand and put it in the right hand, put the shampoo in the right hand. What you want to start thinking about is how to find that physical balance. If you always put the dishes away with the right hand reaching up into the cupboard, start doing it with the left. If you always, or for the most part, answer your phone with the right hand, hold on to the right, answer it with the left for the next 30 days. Think about all the tasks that you do and think about alternating how you do them. I'm not asking you to start, you know, men out there, I'm not asking you to start shaving with a straight edge razor with your left hand if you've always done it with your right. No, that's not what I'm looking for. But if you think that you can shave your legs or even your face with the left hand occasionally, try it for the next 30 days or alternate it in between or do it for two minutes. So you want to start thinking about alternating you can always stand while talking on the phone at home. Use a headset, of course. You can walk around while you're talking. 
gives you a chance to not sit down. If you like to snack while you're reading or watching television or otherwise, take only a small amount with you and leave the rest in the kitchen so you have to get up and get more. Make sure to take hourly stretch breaks when you're on the net. And when you're preparing for a sedentary job, you want to make sure that you're physically fit. So if you like to walk, if you like yoga, if you like doing any kind of exercising, keep integrating that. Here's some really simple exercises. We'll have all this stuff, of course, on the web uh, for you after the session. Some simple things people can do in their office. Now, in the top left-hand picture, we see a guy doing squats. I'm not expecting each employee to load up with weights and start doing squats. We're talking about five up and downs here. We're not talking about losing their breath while they're talking on the phone to a client. I mean, that's the last thing you want is an out-of-breath person talking to somebody on the phone. But small things can be done even in the work environment. We have a, we're going to upload um, a very basic stretching program by Kate Montgomery. Kate Montgomery um, is one of our consultants, and she uh, wrote a book wrote a couple books, and she has a 12-step method of stretches, so we'll have some of those that, that are listed there, and here's some other ideas. There are a lot of benefits to practicing good ergonomics. We talked about some of the stuff that we've learned in the last two years that can be, you know, problematic, whether it's cardiovascular disease or even diabetes, um, but these are some of the things that come from practicing good ergonomics in the workplace. Improved outlook quality of life, reduce blood pressure, that's right, Re uh, decreases the risk of chronic diseases and slows the degenerative effects of aging. Now one final word, of course you always warm up be for beginning physical activities. When you're working in a sedentary job, perhaps every hour, in addition to getting up, when you're sitting in your chair, take a look at the image on the right. Do that for 10 to 30 seconds. If you're on the call right now and you have the ability to do this, do it right now. Just put those arms down at your side. I want you to feel how good that feels. None of us came out of the womb with our arms in the keying position. Some of you may have come out arm for hands first, maybe, like the you know a diver. But most of you didn't come out that way. So hang the arms down, you'll see amazing results by just how relaxed and how reduced tension you feel by doing it. There are some resources that we'll post, including a good book that covers ergonomics, workplace safety. Uh, great book if you have neck or back pain. Robin McKenzie is a New, Jer uh, excuse me, New Jersey, a New Zealand physical therapist who uh, has a remarkable, you can get his books online, you know, three, four dollars used on Amazon. Great books on how people can help their own neck and back pains. Uh, if you're in the California area, we have a great guy, Anthony Carey, wrote a great book called Pain-Free Program. Basically identifies your body type and then allows you to identify you know, certain exercises 15 to 30 minutes a day. And we have another question for our audience. Did we miss one along the way, Diane? No, we just have two right here at the end. I'll go ahead well, and let's ask those. One. I want to thank everyone, and I also want you to know that if you have any questions, you can ask them, of course, of us, and uh, you can put those in your question box. But let's get our polling questions done. Sure. So um, just some feedback we'd like to get from everyone. Did you learn something today that you might share with others? Yes, no, or not sure? We do appreciate your feedback. I'm going to give everyone a couple more seconds to get your answers in. And I also want to remind everyone that we will be sending out an email thanking you for attending today. And that will have a link, again, to go to the Heffernan webinar website. And there you can get the resources from today's webinar. All right, I'm going All to right. go ahead and close out that poll, Steve. And 90% have said yes, they have learned something Good. that they would like to share. That's great, folks. Now, I will, I will pass this on. Remember, 90%, when you, when you watch a webinar, you participate in training, you'll retain 90% of that webinar by going out and doing it and training or helping someone else with it. You'll retain about 50% if you just go and do it. You'll retain only 30% if you just sat and listened today. So if you want to embed this and you want to take this away and make it a part of your life, 
teach it to someone else or commit with somebody else to do some of these things. And we have one last question for our audience, right? Yes, we do. All right. How would you rate today's webinar? Please select one. Really good, good, not so good, or other. Again, thank you for your feedback. We really appreciate it. That's great. And I know that as you're answering that question, Diane, I want to thank our audience for a, for a great um, feedback and for all of them answering those polling questions is so helpful. And uh, we're available, of course, to, for any questions you may have. You can send those uh, to moderator at um, aspenrmg.com uh, and or you can, of course, um, and that's any time you can do that. Uh, and you can respond to the email that, that uh, Diane will send out uh, with all the information, including the 12 steps and the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, you can also respond to that so that, that you can ask any questions. I want to personally thank each of you for being here today. And Diane, I want to thank you for moderating and being a part of today's session also. Thank you, Steve. And before we go, we just do have a question that's come in from several people, if you wouldn't mind answering it. Yeah, we're here, um, and thank you. Yes, they have questions about um, chairs without armrests. Um, why is that better than chairs with the armrest? Exactly. Let's let's uh, let's cover that because that's a really great point. Um, armrests get in the way of things. Unfortunately, they they would get in the way of this person trying to move their desk in. Uh, people also tend to be they use them and their shoulders move forward, so they might be uh, stretching. Uh, being in awkward positions to use them. So one, they get in the way of uh, trying to uh, work uh, effectively in a workstation. Two, they can create um, uneven uh, postures. Uh, people will lean to one side more than the other. Uh, three, they can also use them as a crutch so that their lower back and their abdominal muscles are not being built while they're working. Uh, so they, they act as a, you know, they push the shoulders up, they can push the shoulders forward. They can create a lot of problems. I'm not saying that, that every single situation warrants it. Some people leave them very low, and they might use them to help them sit up or move up in the chair otherwise. They might actually need the armrest to, to, you know, to, as, a, as a device. But for the most part, there's very little need for armrests uh, in, you know, in the modern uh, work environment. Uh, they just get in the way, they create awkward postures, and um, that's that's been the findings over the last uh, few years of the studies. All right, well, thank you very much, and thank you everyone again for being with us today. We really appreciate your time, and have a fantastic day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.